Well, we are in a series called SWAT, Spiritual Warfare and Tactics. And so uh, I believe this is such an important uh, series because we're dealing with real life. Now, I don't know if any of you have dealt with this before, but have you ever felt like, man, I, I just can't seem to overcome this one thing, this one thing in my life. It's like, I've been trying for 15 minutes, I've been trying for 15 years, I've been trying for 15 months, and it just seems I just can't seem to overcome this thing. Maybe you procrastinate and it causes your family duress. Maybe you struggle with finances, you get the credit card down at a feasible amount and you buy something you didn't need to buy. You're impulse buying and, and you, know, you just schedule a trip to Disney and you're $10,000 in debt, now you're $16,000 in debt and you're like, I don't know what does it, I just can't seem to control myself. Or maybe you're struggling with, maybe your spouse or your kids or you're struggling with school, I'm not gonna cheat anymore, I'm gonna do the right thing and chat GPT is writing all your papers, can I hear, oh no. And you're struggling with various things. Or maybe you're involved with something. Maybe you're involved, you know, we always like to pick on the big ones, right? We like to pick on sex, drugs, and rock and roll. The church, right? Makes us feel good. But the bottom line is we all have vices, right? I'm sure you have something in your life. I do. I have something in my life. I'm not going to tell you. Next service, if you come, I'll tell you. <laughs> but I got stuff in my life, too. I'm like, God, why do I still? I'll tell you one of the things I do sometimes, like, I kind of lose a little bit of my patience, okay? And I lose a little bit of my patience, and sometimes I speak in a manner that isn't necessarily the greatest, right? And so sometimes I, you know, and I don't like that. Oh God, I'll never do that again. You do it again. Or maybe, you know, maybe last night, you, you were, everyone's to bed and you're just looking at the internet and you clicked on something. I shouldn't have clicked on that. Maybe you've re reunited a relationship with someone on Facebook or Instagram or your high school person, or maybe you're talking to someone at work that you know is married, but you, you guys get along so well. Maybe I missed my soulmate and I feel so alive, I don't know, I need to just to see I'm not doing anything wrong, and you're there, and you keep on doing that. Maybe, maybe, man, I got a juicy story to tell, and you continually speak stories of no one's business. We all have something. Maybe it's drugs, right? Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's worry. But we all got something in our life. I, I guarantee you, I know if you guys are lying, if anyone doesn't have any problem in their lives, I think everyone in this room it's got one thing that constantly gets you. If I could just get rid of that one thing, everything would change. And you're trying, and you're trying. You do good for a while, spend six months, and you slip back into it again. We all struggle with this. Maybe you don't feel you're pretty enough, right? And, and so you're always looking at other people. Maybe, how about this one, guys? This is a big one. How about the death scroll? You know what a death scroll is, don't you? Not a desk roll, a death scroll. And that's something you put in your mouth and you just chew tobacco. That's, that's skull. Okay. But what happens is you're sitting here and you're looking at something godly. And you're swiping it through, right? And next thing you know, you're trying to think about, wait, well, I need to get a snowblower. And the next thing you know, they got snowblowers. And you start seeing Arnold Schwarzenegger with a snowblower. Sylvester Stallone in a snowblower. And you're like, well, this is cool. And an hour and a half goes by, right? And, and you wasted time. And, and you're late for something. I, I don't know. What, what happens? Are you looking at yourself and, oh, I can't believe they're going on vacation. Why are they doing that? And you start feeling smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as you look at everyone else's life. Everyone else is doing great. You're doing terrible, right? And you look at it and you look at it. You feel bad about yourself. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't, my kids are not going to those schools. I'm by myself or whatever. And you sit there and you feel bad about yourself. And then, you, and then maybe you, you're, the doctor says, hey, listen, you got tri high dry, triglycerides. I can't even say the word. Triglycerides. And you need to take care of your diet. And you just can't seem to control. It's just like at night, sometimes maybe you're, you know, there's some chips hanging around. Can I hear no, no? I'll just have one, right? Let me just tell you a little secret. The best thing you can do is get a bowl, put the chips in the bowl. Do not just take one at a time, Okay? This. And so what we've done, we, we, that's why we have food outside. We want to tempt you and see how you do. So we say a spiritual one. And if you can handle yourself with those donuts, we'll put you in leadership. <laughs> the Bible says God does not tempt and test, but we do. All right. SWAT, spiritual warfare and tactics. You know, I, I read this a number of years ago, but there's a situation. The Romans were terrible uh, 2,000 years ago. They're the ones that invented crucifixion and one of the most painful types of death you could go through. We often hear about that, and sometimes they put you on the cross. 
Jesus, they, broke, they, they were going to break his legs, but he already died. Sometimes you could be on the cross for several days. Animals would crawl on you. Birds would begin to pick on you. And there's something else they would do, probably even worse than crucifixion, is that they had a criminal, and they hated him, or he did something. They would tie, they would, stri- they would chain a dead body upon you and your back. So they'd chain your wrists, and you would have to walk around with this dead body, this cadaver on your back. And it would go, you'd be there and you'd have, to call, you'd have to let you go. And no one could get it off of you. And all of a sudden, the maggots, the decomposing juices would get on you. Birds in the sky would fly. All these little vultures start picking on you. There'd be like, you'd be breathing this putrid smell. And I'm not making this up. This is what they would do. They call it a body of death. They would put on you, and you'd have to go around with this thing. Somewhere just left. Okay, so you go, it'd be on you, and, and you'd be walking around like this, and this thing is crawling on you. Finally, the gangrene gets onto your own skin, and you die a horrible, miserable death, and this thing's on you. The longer it's on you, the more it decomposes. First, you're healthy, but the body's sick, right? The, the one that's on you is a dead body, and you're, you're okay, but eventually the deadness of that of that body of death gets on you and it begins to eat you apart and then you're dead. How many of us feel that way about things in our lives? I got that one thing on my back. They call it a monkey. I don't know why they call it a monkey on the back. I have no idea why they, don't look it up. (laughs) And this thing's on your back and you can't get rid of it. And it just seems like it's okay for a while, but after a while, it's so so shameful that you're afraid to even, I, I don't know if I should even try anymore. I had this body of death, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? The apostle Paul is talking about this body of death. And I think everybody has a body of death someplace in their life that you just can't get rid of, right? Come on, let's be honest. It's frustrating. God will never understand. If anyone ever knew what I did in secret, if this were ever to come out, maybe something you did 15 years ago, maybe you cheated on your wife or your husband. Maybe you got involved with something and you did something that you're so ashamed of. If anyone ever knew what I did, I would be, that would be toast. And you have this shame on you and it's always there. It's always this putrid smell. Just as you're pulling the head, it seems like that cadaver is still on your back. And you get tired of the same thing over and over again. You beat yourself up. Listen, everybody, we're, we all got something. And so this is not the church of the perfect. This is the church of the redeemed. God redeems us, but we all have issues in our lives. So wretched man am I, who would deliver me from this body of death? We all have something, right? Come on, let's be honest. It's just honest. It's heavy. And you start thinking, what good is it for me to even try anymore? I'm tired of faking it. I'm tired of going to church and saying one thing and walking outside and being another. I just read this past week uh, in the Christian Post uh, last week about a pastor who had this secret life. And it came out, he was disgraced by it. And he took his own life. Horrible. Now, why would I mention this on a Sunday morning? Because sin, left to its own devices, will eat you alive. And if we don't deal with this body of death that's on our lives, it will take us out. And God does not want us to be taken out. And you do not have to give in to your own nature. The Bible says you're under no obligation to follow the flesh. You don't have to give in to your proclivities. You don't have to give in to lust. You don't have to give in to these things. I can't help myself. Maybe you're at that point right now, but you do not have to give in to it. Our culture says you are controlled by your environment. It's not what happens in you. It's what happens outside of you. Change your outside. Change No, everything. You don't have to live with this on your life. You don't have to to live in misery. You don't have to live with this body of death. God wants to take this thing off your back. God wants to get rid of that monkey on your back. Amen. And it can happen. And it will happen. But you and I need to understand something first. We need to get in a position to do it. So as we're talking about spiritual warfare, we went through it last week. Spiritual warfare is real and you're in a battle like it or not. We're not fighting against flesh and blood, which we're going to read in a few seconds. Finally, the Bible says in Ephesians, and by the way, the Apostle Paul is chained to a Roman guard when he is dictating or writing this letter. 
chained to a Roman guard. He sees the, the Roman armament, and he's writing this to the church. Finally, he says, be strong in the Lord. And, and, and actually, that's a passive Greek verb, be strong, means, it means don't be strong in yourself, but be strong in the Lord. It's like a sailboat. Catch the wind. Put your sail, catch the wind. Let the wind fill your sail that you can navigate, you can get propulsion. And so be strong, not in yourself, but be strong in the Lord, that you know it's God and not you. You see, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's going to irritate you. It irritates me. I'm going through a hard time. You know what you need to do? What? Let go and let God. Really? <laughs> what are you, Ben Kenobi? Let go and let God. It sounds so wonderful. How on earth do you let go and let God? How? How do you do it, right? We hear about it all the time. I just got to let go and let God. The problem is you and I don't want to let go. Reminds me of a story of a man that fell off a cliff. He was hanging onto the root system, and it was all foggy. And then someone says, let go, and I got you. He was crying out to God, God, help me, help me, help me. Let go, and I got you. Is there anyone else up there? <laughs> I don't want to let go, right? I want some kind of control. And so, you know, and, and this is what begins to happen to us in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Right now, some of us are not standing anymore. We're lying down on the job. We're not, we're not in a spiritual battle. We're barely holding on. We're barely living. We're faking it. We're coming to church just to check the box, right? But I, I am not standing in God. I am weak. The earth, the earth has beat me up. My, my whole life is beating me up. That you may be able to stand against the schemes that you have an enemy out there that wants to get you. Now, we talked about this because here's the reality. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It isn't your spouse. It isn't your boss. It isn't your dog. It isn't the government. There is a spiritual forces in high places. And if you and I are fighting against the wrong enemy, we can't win. If you're shadow boxing, as we mentioned last week, we have to go to the source and deal with the source, right? We do not flush against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces and evil in the heavenly places. We mentioned last week there are all kinds of hierarchy out there. There's all kinds of demons. The Satan has never bothered me or you. He's only one person. He's defeated. His time is short. The, the, the decisive battle has been won. Now there's in the mob up operations of all history, and he knows his times is short, so he's trying to inflict as much damage as he can. And he's fighting against you and I, and he understands that God is greater than himself, so he wants to get you to believe lies. If he gets you to believe lies, he can control your lives. And that's why lies are so powerful when they're believed. And our culture is all about lies. We're being told lies constantly. And it is not the Republican or Democrat. It's not the school board or, or your mother-in-law. What it is, it's the enemy is speaking lies. And if it gets us to believe the lies, he gets a hook in our mouth and he controls us. Because the truth of the matter is God is stronger than the enemy. And so what he tries to get us to do is believe lies. And that's his surprise, is to get you to believe lies, and you don't even realize it. This is what begins to happen. So, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. So, we're going to be going through this, not today, but the whole armor of God, where all the different attributes to fight and win this battle, you and I need to have to win. Take up the full armor of God, not what you want, that you may be able to what? Withstand that you are able to withstand. You're able to stand up in the middle of the storm. You're able to stand and not fall. Withstand in the evil day. When's the evil day? Every day is an evil day, <laughs> right? What does Jesus say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added for you. Do not worry tomorrow about tomorrow. So sufficient is today's evil, right? Every day you and I have to fight something. And if you and I will learn to resist the enemy, what happens, resist them in the small, you begin to develop spiritual muscles that when the big time comes, you're ready to take them out. So you start small, okay? So stand firm. So 
Here we go. Let's take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand firm. Don't give up. That's the enemy one. There's no, there's no use to it. You know you can't do it. You can never get out of debt. You can never heal that marriage. You, can, you can't live with that man. You can't live with that woman. You can't handle those kids. You can't handle that job. You don't have enough education. You're not smart enough to do it. You're stuck in this. And you're like, I can't stand anymore. And you got that body of death on you. It says, you'll be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all, stand firm. And then he says, stand therefore. He keeps on stand, right? I can't stand it. When you can't stand it, stand. When you can't stand it, stand. Don't give up. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Now, what is that supposed to mean? We mentioned it's real. We mentioned we're in a battle, like it or not. We mentioned God is all-powerful and over the devil. It's not equal. It's not yin and the yang. No, there's no competition. So the only way the enemy can win is through terror, terror warfare, guerrilla warfare. What we see going on with Hamas right now in, in Israel is what the enemy does. He's not powerful enough, so he, he does guerrilla tactics. He has tunnels underneath the hospitals of your lives, under the sacred area. I can't touch that. That's religious. And he has these little nests of his demons in your life. I'm not saying you're demon-possessed. What I'm saying is he has a, a whole tunnel, tunnel network, and you and I have to go in there and release the dogs, the dogs of heaven, to take them out. We need to bomb out those tunnels. Because the enemy is there. And you might go into some places you don't want to go. Because if, 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 if anyone ever found out that there's a hospital above me, they're going to they're gonna think I'm really a bad person. But the only way you're going to take out your enemy is to take out your enemy. You have to go to the places. So spiritual warfare, God, of all, God is all powerful over the devil. And the battleground is the flesh, the world, and the devil. We fight against the flesh. And let me just say right now, your primary enemy is not the devil, not even the world. Your, your biggest enemy is you. That's it. That's, I'd rather fight you. I'd rather fight the devil than fight me, right? But your biggest enemy is you, and your best friend is you. And so with the choice, the real battle is within you. And the front lines of that battle is in your mind. That's the front gate. The only way the enemy gets in is to get you to believe a lie because he's the father of lies. So you have to build a huge wall with watchtowers. And you have to make sure every time that enemy comes in, you have a security system. And that when he comes in, you take out that thought. I am not going to live in that place. I'm not going to let that thought have a life in me. Well, how do you do that? You see, it all starts in the mind. The enemy gets you to believe a lie. A lie is a deception. A lie is a virus taken to extreme. It can drive you to a place of destruction. So the battleground is the flesh, the world, and, and this is the world, the world system, right? We live in a world, and there is a devil. But the devil doesn't have as much power as we give him. Let me say that again. The devil does not give us as much power as we give him. We empower the devil. We empower the enemy by ingesting lies, by not giving up our stuff, and he gets control. But the Bible is very clear. Greater is he within you than he is in the world. There's no competition, everybody. So how do we overcome sin? How do we get that dead cadaver off our body? How do we break free? Well, the biggest trick is to fight the wrong battle. So we're supposed to stand, and we're, we can't even stand. We're laying down. We're, we're, I mean, if you are so sick, you can't even go to the front lines. God has us to make a difference in this world. But if we're fighting against ourselves and we're fighting against each other, good luck. We're not going to do much. But I'm convinced that if you or I will begin to surrender to God, the dead body in our life, and begin to help each other, let me just say this. There's nothing that God can't do through you in this church. In fact, I would venture to say if every single person that comes to this church 
We completely surrender to God and say, God, I'm not gonna do it my way. You're the boss and I'm not, I'm gonna trust you. If we would all do that and we would lock arm in arm and help each other, I, t- I kid you not, this church, this one church could change the world. Not because of me or Cornerstone, it's because if we are completely submitted to God, God can take 120 people in the upper room and change the planet. So why not give him a chance to change our lives, right? Why not? He can do it. Nothing's impossible for God. You have to start believing the truth because the lies will get you. So the biggest trick of the fight, the wrong battle. The big battle is inside of you. And this is the one called fighting condemnation. The devil is called the accuser of the brethren. Why is it that our world right now, our media, our world, popular culture right now is called the cancel culture? You make one mistake off with your head, you're canceled forever. You know why? Because everyone knows deep inside they got a monkey, they got a dead cadaver on their back, and they don't want to deal with their cadavers. They want to kill yours, so they don't have to. They want to kill you, so they don't have to deal with it on their own back. And you'll find this sometimes the biggest biggest people that cause a, a massive pain are people that have most problems. Hurt people, hurt people. Condemn people. Condemn people. So people know they should be canceled. And so rather than deal with their own canceling, they want to cancel you. Make no mistake about it. That is a symptom of a guilty conscience that they're trying to push away. And they want to blame everyone else but themselves. Fighting condemnation. How do you do it? Now, we're going to take you, a le- this is like, I don't know what happened here, but the Apostle Paul, it looks like he left his, his journal behind. And he wrote some stuff in here that you don't want to read. Because it describes everything you and I go through. You guys ready to read this here a little bit? This is the word of God. You're not alone in this. Look at this. This is Apostle Paul. Look what he says. Here, this, if this does not describe your situation, then, then you're more spiritual than anyone in this room and the Apostle Paul, and you should be worshipped. I can say that with great confidence because no one can do that, okay? For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. God, this is the last time. I swear to you, God, this is the last. No more. I'm done with this. I'm not going to tell anybody. This is my secret. I'm not, I can't tell anyone what's going on. Right? But I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it's not good. I know I shouldn't do this. I know I shouldn't say these things. I know I shouldn't smoke this. I know I should not say that. I know I shouldn't look at that person or hold it unforgiveness, right? I know it's not good. But what happens? So now, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin who dwells within me. So there are people that say, oh, you know what? God understands your heart. Just go ahead and sow some wild oats and just come to Jesus. Oh, Jesus, forgive me. And go ahead and do it again. Oh, Jesus, forgive me. So God understands it's just sin. And what happens is your mind gets seared. And you just think, hey, I'll just go, hey, Jesus, come and sin. I'll just do what I want. I just read the other day, yesterday, and, and uh, Hebrews chapter 10, talks about he who sins and continues to sin and doesn't care is in jeopardy of the fires of hell. Now, I don't make that determination. But if you're saying, I don't care what God says, I'm going to do it my own way. That's between you and God. But for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right. I want to be right, but I, but I don't have the ability to carry it out. I, I didn't mean to put that on the credit card. I didn't mean to say that to her. You just, you're sitting in a, in, a, in a conversation, and you hear the voice, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. Let me be frank with you. And you, you don't be frank. Be Jesus. <laughs> Anytime someone says, let me be frank with you, don't say it. I don't know who Frank is, but Frank's got problems, and you don't need to be Frank. So no longer it is I who do, but the sin that dwells within me, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. I want to study, and I procrastinate. I want to get this thing done, and I don't. God, help me. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Can I hear, I understand? You need help. (laughs) So do I. 
I love the Bible. It's so real, man. It just says it like it is, right? That's why I believe the Bible. Part One of the reasons why. I do the evil I do not want to do. I keep on doing it. Now, if I want to do what I... Now, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that's within me. And it's true. It's the same within me. So I want to get rid of it. I got to get rid of this passenger in my car. I got to get rid of this cadaver. And I don't know how to get rid of this thing on my back. So I find it to be a law when I want to do the evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law. I come to church. I sing the songs and I lift up my hands again and again. Oh, Lord, I give it all to you. Meanwhile, you're thinking, I can't wait to post that on the internet, right? For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man or woman that am I, who will deliver me from this body of death? I was just reading an amazing book Quote, I want to read it to you. I don't know, don't like to read things that are too long, but boy, he just really nails it. This guy named Toy Hessen, he's already passed away. But then his book called Forgotten Factors says this, and boy, just, this really describes what we go through. It's what he says. In that condition, he says, in that condition of despair, we have little motivation but to commit further sin. You're despairing, you have little motivation but to do it again. Our spiritual situation is so dead and unsatisfying that we feel it is a further act of sin is not going to make a difference. I've already done this. I might as well continue to do it. The most we can hope for in a situation is to hide some of more shameful sins. But the longer we hide the sin, the longer it goes on condemning us, and we get more and more under the domination. It is obvious from all of this, the real purpose of Satan is provoking us to commit sin. It, oh, I'm sorry, let me read this again. The, let me read it again, I'm sorry. It's obvious from all of this, the real purpose of Satan is provoking us to commit sin is not what he would do. Instead, he wants us to do something unethical. So when he's done, we've done it, he has the opportunity to accuse us. He doesn't care about the sin. He just wants to accuse you. He's called the accuser of the brethren in Revelation 12. And then in that condition, we're rendered powerless. The Christian who has committed an impure act feels himself the next day in utter dogs. He does not want to look God or fellow Christians in the eye. As for taking a spiritual service, he would, he would rather run. And so something in us is this. It's like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I got this on me. There's condemnation. I'm accused, constantly accused. And if anyone ever knew what happened, I'm not going to do it again. And you do something worse. To the point is, what is the recourse? How do I get out of this? Who would deliver me from this body of death? Romans 7, 15 says this. Thanks be to who? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Therefore, there's no condemnation. It's called, I call it condemnation because you always feel damned by it. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Okay, so I can do what I want. No, we have to give it up. And so I want to do the remaining few moments we have left is learn how to get rid of that cadaver on our backs. Here it is. Stand in the power of Jesus. Oh, what is that supposed to mean? Let me explain. Jesus came to this planet. He gave up all of his power of heaven, and he became one of us. So he, he basically became Adam and Eve again. And what he did is he faced every sin that you and I will face, and he beat it down. He beat sin. 
And so our objective, everybody, is to get in the draft of Jesus. Get so, the closer you get to Jesus, the easier it is. In NASCAR, what they do, they have the, the, often the great drivers, they'll get in the draft of the car behind them, and then they're like this close. It's fantastic when they get in a car accident, but that's beside the point. So <laughs> they get so close like this, and the draft is over them. So the guy in front of them is taking all the, or the gal is taking all the, uh, all the, uh, the wind resistance. So, so they sit there, they're going to downshift the car, and they're going to have power to overpass it because the draft is off of them. And they can pass and win the race. Jesus takes the draft for us. But you and I need to get close to the bumper of Jesus. We need to let his draft, you see, you can't do it on your own. But Jesus did it. So the Bible says no temptation has overtaken you but what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with every temptation will provide an avenue of escape that you may be able to stand under it. So this baloney, I can't help myself, is not true. You can help yourself. You and I have to take ownership or we're never going to get it free. But you can't do it in yourself. You have to do it in Christ Jesus. And the only way you can do it in Christ Jesus is you and I have to surrender. Can I ask you a favor? Can I have your phone? Thanks. Okay. I got his phone. I got Isaiah's phone. Now, Isaiah, you know what I'm going to do? Here. Here, have this. So this is for you. I just gave it up. Now, did I really give up my phone? No. The only way I can give up my phone, I'm not going to give it to you. You can't give away something unless you own it. Let me say that again. You can't give something away until you own it. The only way you can give something, is this my phone? And now, Hannah, can you please come here for a second? Hannah, you give it back to me. This is an illustration. Here. <laughs> this is yours. She's got my phone now. I gave it to her because I owned it. Until you own your sin, you'll never get rid of it. You have to take ownership of it. A real man, a real woman, takes ownership of it. I have sinned. Stand in the power of Jesus. I can do some things. No, I can do, listen, we either believe the Bible or we don't. If not, we'll just, why don't we just quit going to church? I got better things to do than to have some theory that doesn't work. This, this actually, actually, actually works. I can, say it, I can, I can. Do, all do all things through hard work, through hard work. and coming to Cornerstone <laughs> and giving political commentary on social media. No, I can do all things through what? Christ. Through Christ, who? Strength. Okay, this is the answer. Do you believe it or not? Yes. Okay, let's walk in there. How do you do it? Uh, Colossians 2.15. He, that she has disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them in open shame by triumphing over them in him. They basically, it's the image of what they used to do in Rome. When they used to beat the enemy, they would march the enemy through the town and go through an arch and make a spectacle of the enemy. Jesus made a spectacle of the enemy. But the only way you can join the parade is you have to give up. You have to give. Take ownership of your sin. Stand on the power of Jesus. Don't tolerate sin. Well, it's only a youthful indiscretion. No, it's called adultery. Well, I'm just, I'm just hooking it up. No, you're fornicating. Let's call it what it is. Hello. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm not reporting it. No, it's called stealing. Let's stop the nonsense. Let's be real men and real women and call it what it is. And don't look at your neighbor and say it. Look at yourself. Right? Don't tolerate sin. Don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant? I hear people say this all the time. You know, it's the, the Bible says that his kindness leads us to repentance. There's even songs about it. His kindness leads us to repentance. And people quote to me all the time. Well, his kindness leads to repentance. They don't read the rest of the verse. Let's read it in context. Hello. Don't you see how wonderfully kind? Tolerant? Yeah, he's tolerant. And patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? 
Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from sin? So he's not pouring it out. Hey, I'll give you an opportunity to get it right. Before your father comes home, I, I suggest you might want to get things right. right? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Next first, hello, same context. But because you are what? And refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible pun what kind of God? punishment for yourself. For a day is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Hello. So just because he's not punishing, listen, God wants the best for you. But he will not allow sin to continue because it destroys you, it destroys his creation. Look at all the trash that's going on in the world right now. Look at the stuff going on in your own family. Look at the stuff in your own life. Why not get rid of that cadaver? The vultures are flying around you waiting to pick at you. Why not get rid of it? We put blankets on it, we put perfume on it, we try to cover the cadaver, and we've gotten pretty sophisticated at it. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. So, give it up. It's time to give up. If you want to go up, you got to give up. Take ownership. Now, how on earth do you do that? Here it is. <laughs> Stand in the power of Jesus, number one. Number two, don't tolerate sin. Stop making excuses. Wimps make excuses. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of wimpy Christians. Be a man. Be a woman. Take ownership. Say it. Confess it. Get rid of it. You'll never be free until you confess it. Now be smart about it. Confess and resist. If we confess our sins, if you take ownership of your sin, he, who, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, he'll take the cadaver off your back. Wouldn't that be nice? So, James 4, 7, humble yourself. You know what the original sin was? It was drinking with the boys. No, it wasn't drinking with the boys or playing with the boy toys. No, what happened, the original sin was pride. Pride. Hum humility breaks Satan like nothing else except for love. So humble yourselves before who? Resist the devil. You don't have to give in to it. And he will what? Flee. Flee from you. I don't have time to break that down. So stand in the power of Jesus. Don't tolerate sin. Confess and resist and fight with Jesus and his. All I need is you. All I need is you, Lord, is you, Lord. We sing these songs. That's not really theologically correct. God, you don't just need Jesus. Well, Pastor, how can you say that? Well, hang on. That's number one. But Jesus wants you to be part of a body. He never sent his disciples out by themselves. He always sent them out two by two. And a couple of times it did happen once or twice, but mostly he sent them out in groups. Why? Because you and I need each other. One can chase a thousand, two, ten thousand. Now check this out. But if we walk, if I walk, does it say I? What does it say? Okay. It doesn't say me. If me walk, if we, look at your neighbors here, we, we. <laughs> but if we walk in the light, lights are on. As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Okay? And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from what? All sin, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Therefore, confess. No, but by the way, don't go on the internet and confess all your stuff. Find trusted people. There are people out there that can't handle it, okay? So be careful. I'm not saying, I'm gonna, okay, I missed. No, no, don't do that. Okay, therefore, confess your sins to what? So confess your sins just to Jesus. Jesus, forgive me. You know, one of the things the Catholics get right, they go to the confessional. That's a good thing. Go, I'm glad I don't do it, but 
But seriously, you need to confess to each other. What? Confess to what? One another and what? Pray for one another. That you may be what? Healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power. When does prayer have great power? When these conditions are being met. You see that? The context is, you do these things, look out. If you and I would stop competing against each other and start completing each other, we start comparing boyfriends and girlfriends, comparing schools, comparing outfits, comparing jobs, comparing their children, comparing your salary, how much you make and how much you don't make. I don't know about you, but I'm sick to death of the comparison world that's out there. Wouldn't it be nice if we could go to a place where we don't care about competing, we care about completing. And no matter who you are, or what you, wouldn't that be nice to be a place like that? Well, it can be that way. Why not make it that way? And I'm seeing it happen. When I see people rallying around people and, and helping them move, when I see people rallying around people, bringing them meals and praying for each other, not caring about themselves, but reaching, that's, that's what makes the body beautiful, right? Stop competing and start completing in Christ Jesus. Let me ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Lord, I, I, I stand here today, Lord, not above the fray. And Father, I recognize that everyone in this room, myself included, Lord, we got some stuff on our backs. And Lord, we don't want to walk out of here without a plan to get rid of it. Father, forgive us for making excuses. For we know that the excuse does not set us free. The truth sets us free. And Father, we thank you that greater are you that's within us than he that's in the world. Father, I thank you we're under no obligation to obey the sinful nature of our lives. Forgive us for believing the lie. We refuse to, to bow down to the enemy anymore. We choose to believe your word over our thoughts and our feelings. And to, Lord, today, Lord, we recognize, we take ownership of these secret sins that we've done. We take ownership of sinning by doing certain things. Attitudes. We take ownership of it. Lord, Lord, I give it to you right now. Go ahead, right now. Just give it to him. Whatever that area of your life is, one or two things. Say, Lord, I give you. I give it to you right now. I give comparison to you. Father, I give procrastination to you. Father, I give pornography to you and lust. Father, I give anger to you. Go ahead, just give it to him right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I give it to you. Take it from me. I confess it right now. I ask you to take it off me. Lord, I break this off of me. Lord, in Jesus' name, would you show me who I can tell? Another believer that can pray with me, that's not going to betray me, but will pray with me. Lord, I pray that you would bring people to the right group of people, that we could walk together, that we could pray powerfully, and we should be set free, and free people, free people. And so, Lord, in Jesus' name, I ask for a supernatural impartation of that in Jesus' name.